true hawaya yak isu ah eh bet utla se shay in chat is tak shit la hoset nu chonalat la kesh beat ma as a tek shit se si hat hawaya hiksu algonquin algonquin territories ma chanapsik ma tekitsu like go at sush net nexo sex yet i am i in chat want to express appreciation for the very warm welcome by the chief this morning chief white duck and elder commander thank you for the welcome to your territories and to our elders for the prayer and for the drum this morning and also for the elders who led us in the pipe ceremony a wonderful way to to get started this morning as i said in my language to the chiefs grand chiefs to council members delegates members of first nations governments to the veterans to the elders to the women council youth council to my executive colleagues regional chiefs it's an honor to be here with all of you today really pleased that you were able to safely make it here to the gathering to our special chiefs assembly given all of the travails out there in the weather that's that's really hit us welcome to our 2010 special chiefs assembly we've chosen as you can see the executive have building on our success moving from endorsement to action as our theme because like you i believe that that's exactly where we are today about to deliver real change for our people i'm very honored to be here with all of you today as a fighter we fight to make those changes a reality for all of our people the people who send us here it's my privilege to meet some of the most impressive of our people as i travel and work in our communities. Quinn Miwasage, I want to point out, is one such person. Quinn is an inspirational young man from Serpent River First Nation. I met him at a rally on Parliament Hill earlier this fall. And during that event, our youth were invited to speak to us about their lives and about their hopes. And Quinn was one of those who was brave enough to take up the challenge and I have to tell you that he told us a story one familiar to all of us about the obstacles that he and his friends face every single day. I was very moved then when I got a message from from his chief Chief Isidore Day. Chief Day told me that shortly after we met Quinn entered a treatment program. He took personal responsibility to clear his life of drugs and alcohol. What was even more impressive was that Quinn stood up in front of his community to explain the decision that he took. He said that he sees hope for his future and that he knows that he must prepare himself to be a leader. These are achievements of our people. Some of them are small private achievements like that. and that's what we're here to support. This is what we fight for. Quinn's story is part of our duty to our future generations. As leaders of our people, we struggle to bring hope to to create options that will inspire confidence and to ensure that together we pass to them a better future. I've had many encounters like this with people just like Quinn overcoming the odds. young men and women stepping up taking responsibility for their lives and for their futures demonstrating that while they are so often told that they're the leaders of tomorrow that there are leaders right now this in the united nations year of the youth our people are calling for change and they expect us to take action to help them to mobilize and to direct their energy and ideas toward a better future for their families for their communities and for stronger governments. I said at the annual general assembly in July in Winnipeg that we can if we choose create real change in our lifetimes. 
that we could create the opportunity for that change not in 50 years, not in 25 years, but within five years starting right now. Because quite frankly, our people, especially our kids, simply can't wait. Our theme here, moving to action, speaks to this important moment of opportunity for the advancement of our peoples. Your hard work delivered one important change, Canada's endorsement of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was an important victory. Canada changed its vote from no to yes on November 12th as a result of years of advocacy by our people. Let us acknowledge the hard work of the world's 370 million Indigenous peoples and offer our thanks to the many leaders from Canada, many of them in this room with us today, for their years of effort, their work in shaping the Declaration itself and fighting for its endorsement. And as should be the focus, this will be our first item of business here at our Assembly. The Declaration serves as a guide. It's a path to respect, to reconciliation, and a partnership. And we, as the Indigenous peoples, were directly involved in its drafting. It's a path that reflects our historic relationship as treaty partners, as nations that never surrendered our lands, never surrendered our rights, never surrendered our resources. We are reminded in a moment like this of the many heroic leaders of Indigenous peoples around the world and across the ages whose lives and whose work inspires all of us today. The great Shawnee Chief Tecumseh, who was driven by the idea of uniting our nations to stand strong in the face of oppression. The wisdom of Anishinaabe Chief Shingwakans, who understood the importance of education. Education not only to advance our people's goal of economic development, but its importance in sustaining our languages and our cultures. The great leader of South Africa's Indigenous peoples, Nelson Mandela, a chief of his own people who proved that a true leader's spirit cannot be broken. Indeed, he proved that a leader's strong spirit can break down and bring down an entire regime through courage, unshakable conviction, and most importantly, an appeal to justice and fairness. We look to our heroes today. We have many in this room right now. And I think of the many heroes we have among our young people. And so let's honor the dream of Shannon Kustachin from Ottawa Piscat, a teenager and passionate advocate of fairness in education, a brave young woman who looked the Minister of Indian Affairs in the eye and said softly, but with irresistible conviction, my community deserves a school. Tragically, we lost Shannon this year. But her legacy lives on in Shannon's dream, a campaign to struggle for better First Nations education for all our children. And to the boys and girls of Attawapiskat, she has left a powerful personal legacy. Shannon got them a school. We celebrate the memory and the achievements of our leaders of yesterday. We stand today united, determined to build on their legacy, to frame a strategy for action for our people in the coming year. And today we stand strong as our usual critics try to attack us and knock us off course. They have no understanding of the day-to-day -day reality in our communities, no understanding of the responsibilities of you, the chiefs, who have to work as leaders negotiators, grief counselors, carpenters, municipal planners, mentors, and managers, often all in the same day. And yet our critics brand us as irresponsible. They smear the more than 3,300 chiefs and counselors across the country by exaggerating the pay of a small few through phony math while we're not buying into their game. I say that we stand strong and united and show that First Nations are not only not afraid of change and transparency, we are blazing the trail forward. We will set the standards of, your, of transparency and accountability for our people. 
not Ottawa bureaucrats. As we have been called to do, we will stand strong against every attack. As National Chief this past 18 months, every single month, I have been honoured to accept invitations by you, the leaders, to walk side by side in the fight for change for our people. Our people are fighting back on all fronts. We are fighting back to save our waters, to protect our lands, to protect our heritage that is rightfully ours. We reject the status quo, a reality where our young people are four times more likely to commit suicide more likely to be incarcerated than to graduate from high school, and where over 500 of our women are murdered or missing. We reject decrepit housing and do not accept filthy drinking water or conditions that puts our kids or our families at risk. We are taking a stand and we're telling all Canadians that we do not accept this. We do not accept the imposition of government policy and regulation that pins our people down and holds our economies back. We can and will move forward. Our recent Montreal Forum on Nation Building and Rebuilding demonstrated clearly that it is First Nations peoples themselves who will strengthen our governance and accountability. A sincere merci beaucoup to the leaders of Quebec and Labrador who hosted us for this forum as the leadership came together to discuss and share strategies on citizenship, treaty implementation, land tenure, economic development, and transparent and effective public administration and accountability at the community level. Canada's endorsement of the United Nations Declaration gives us an opportunity to hit the reset button on our relationship with the Crown and our efforts to enable and to build our, our governments. Standing firmly on our rights, on our treaties, our languages and cultures, the UN Declaration can help serve as a guide in this work. As directed by you, I've had conversations with the Prime Minister and will continue to press him and the Minister of Indian Affairs to engage in discussions on the development of a work plan and best approaches to work toward affirming the rights reflected in the Declaration, rights that are the new standards by which First Nations-Canada relationship is defined. We are calling for a First Nations Crown gathering involving the Prime Minister and First Nations leaders. The Prime Minister says he is committed to working with us on this, and we will hold him to his commitment. Without a doubt, the old days of unilateralism are still very much with us. The legislative agenda before Parliament dealing with water is one such bad example. That bill is unacceptable in its current form. And we've pointed to a better way, a way that supports our local community leaders and a path that is genuinely and leads to genuinely safe drinking water for our people. On the other hand, last week I was invited to the gallery of the House of Commons as Minister Duncan finally made public a commitment to all of our people to work with us on K-12 education. The government's pledge comes exactly one year, and you will recall when we as chiefs, we stood in assembly behind our youth demanding at action on education. And so this is a good new start. A task force will report both to the minister and importantly to all First Nations. Following the eight regional sessions and one national session that we will hold early next year, we will then fully discuss this at our assembly this summer in Moncton to confirm the way forward. We know that it is our people, not the government, and certainly not Indian Affairs that have been leading innovation in education, developing curriculums and schools focused on our students' success. We know the importance of language and culture in their success. We understand the essential role of parents, of families, and their communities in their success. And we will ensure that those ideas and that vision is brought forward to begin a fundamental transformation in First Nations education. We know that leadership is about accountability and delivering on an agenda of change. We know that it rests on a foundation of governance that is mandated and acceptable to our people. 
Good governance is about relationships. It always has been. Our treaties with the Crown define that relationship as opposed to the unilateral imposition of an outdated and crumbling piece of legislation. As Chiefs, as the Assembly of First Nations, we've been mandated by our people to be their strong advocates, to secure full recognition and respectful implementation of their treaties, rights, and title. That will mark the path of truly transformative change, to be achieved at a rate and pace as determined by First Nations. The treaties belong to our people, not the Assembly of First Nations. Our task is to advocate and to fight for their full implementation, to win real change for our people, for their lives and for their futures. We are pressing hard on a long list of other initiatives to deliver these changes. Under your instruction, we are working to build on ideas that have been around for a long time, such as a treaty tribunal to adjudicate conflicts and the development of a First Nations Rights Fund. And as our Assembly progresses, we'll have more detail on these and other initiatives. We have had a long and difficult relationship with the Government of Canada. Our people bear the scars of the ill-considered policies that have been imposed on us. We would not be honest if we did not admit that it's created a legacy of deep mistrust and suspicion about any new promises, any in new initiatives from government ministers, including from prime ministers. I understand that skepticism, and I share it. My approach has been to be very candid with the Prime Minister and his ministers. I set out very clearly our minimum expectations of them. I press on them the urgency of change, and I make it crystal clear that it is their action, it is their delivery, not their promises that our people will judge. As leaders of our peoples, we know very well that we stand on the shoulders of giants, people like the elder Pete Waskahut. We are blessed by the legacy of leadership they demonstrated, often at times far more bitter than those that we face and often with far less power and fewer resources than we command now. As we go into serious discussions over treaty implementation and better opportunities for our children and our communities, I often think about them. I seek, as I know you do, their inspiration for our struggles today. Leaders and chiefs like the, the late Grand Chief Dr. Billy Diamond, who passed away just a few months ago, and we're honoured to have many members of his family with us here, and later today we will honour his memory and his achievements. His leadership and his successes are truly legendary. He also had wise advice about the challenge of leadership. When asked about being a leader for his people for so long, here is what he said, and I quote, you have to learn to stand alone as a leader. I went through tough times, but you have to set aside all of your personal wants and thoughts. You have to get yourself out of your mind, and you have to think only for your people. That's the vision of leadership to which we all aspire. That's how we remember the ancestors and the elders that have given us their wisdom and their strength, a strength that protected our people and our homelands since the time of creation. Our responsibility then, and indeed our inheritance, is to lead today in honour of their achievement, to work together to deliver change for our people as a commitment to those who are not yet born, for they will walk the trails that we clear for them today. So just as Grand Chief Billy Diamond instructs us, as we go forward as leaders over the days here together and beyond, we will remember the struggle of our people, and we will work tirelessly to deliver real change. And I, for one, am honoured to join you in that work every single day. Chu, Kleko, Kleko. Thank you.